All right, go All ahead. Right. All right, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for attending another session of Grad Recon today. And um, this is the project planning, getting your research thesis or dissertation done. My name is Sydney Young. I am one of the graduate assistants at the Office of Graduate Student Life. And I'm also a second year master's of public health student in co concentrating in community health promotion. So happy to see you all today. Thank you so much for joining us. I'll go ahead and introduce our presenter today, Vicki Dominic, who is the Associate Director for Learning Services. Vicki, thank you so much for presenting today and sharing your time and wisdom with us. I'll go ahead and pass it over to you, just so everybody does know that we are recording this session. Every All recordings, any other session materials will be available on the Grad Recon website, which I will put into the chat. Um, but yes, Vicki, I'll pass it over to you and I'll be checking people in and looking at the chat for you. Thank you, Sydney. I appreciate your time. Welcome, everybody, um, for today's session on um, project planning, getting your research thesis or dissertation done. Before I start to jump into the content, let me just tell you a little bit about Learning Services in case you're not familiar with our office. So we are here to help students achieve whatever their academic goals are, and we do that through providing things like academic success workshops, we have a workshop series specifically for grad students called Maximizing Productivity in Graduate School. And um, you are welcome to attend those, but you can attend any of the workshops that we're offering um, in addition to this partnership for Grad Recon. Mm -hmm. um, we also provide one-on-one -on -one academic coaching. So it's a little different than success coaching. If you've seen your success coach, we're really um, focused on like the nitty gritty, like what's going on this semester um, in terms, and will help students with time management or motivation or, um, you know, putting together a timeline for a big project like this. Um, we're here to help with that. And we have, um, in addition to peer coaches, we have graduate assistants and we have learning specialists and the learning specialists are professional staff members. So if you're like, I don't want to see a peer coach, we have grads and we have um, learning specialists that you are very welcome to meet with. Uh, in addition, we have some resources on our web page and on our YouTube channel. Um, and often when we record the sessions for the grad programs, we'll record that, make it available for Grad Live, and put it on our on our YouTube channel as well. So you can check that out. Our handle is um, Mason Learning. All right, so let's go ahead and get started with today's session. Um, we're going to talk about basically how to create a very large project for, a, which could be a project for grad school. It could be that you're writing a thesis. It could be that writing a dissertation. So these are strategies to help you get through that, putting together a large project like that. So we're gonna talk about making a schedule, how to plan your projects, strategies for organizing yourself and your material, We'll talk about the writing process um, and then ways that you can get support and get feedback, what to do when life happens, because life always happens, and strategies for managing internal blocks or like sometimes we get in our own way. And so what are some strategies that we can use to help manage that? All right. So. Learning services, I think the number one thing I talk with students about is time management. So we're going to start with that um, to talk about with this. So for grad students, I like to think of time management at like four different levels. So four levels, the first level being long term deadline stuff, like two to three years out. So looking at um, like when you want to graduate and when you need to have your thesis or dissertation, the thesis, dissertation, and project submitted to the university dissertation and thesis services office, right? That's a long-term goal. Or if there's any conferences you want to attend, that is like long-term, couple years out time management that I recommend you go ahead and get yourself a calendar and you put it on there in a way that you can see it. The next level is kind of your semester, what's going on, and that's where we're going to put big deadlines. So things like 
you know, your classes, because usually we're still taking classes. Sometimes we're finished with all of this, with all the other stuff, but you're going to put that or any uh, other deadlines that you have that are immediate, that are happening this semester. We're going to put that onto a calendar. We also need to establish a weekly routine. So that's the third level. The third level is what does my schedule each week look like? Um, and I'm going to talk more about strategies for putting together a weekly schedule. Um, and then we've got our daily tasks. What are the things that I need to work on today? Okay. So we're going to start big picture and then like we narrow, narrow, narrow till we're actually dealing with like, what do I need to get done today? It is very important when you're doing this that you include time for rest, for breaks, for fun and recreation. Your schedule should always have things in it that you want to do and not just the things that you have to do. We need things to look forward to and we have to like rest and rejuvenate our brains and our bodies. So it's not about, you know, just going full speed ahead all the time because that's when we end up with burnout. We don't want that to happen. So I know it seems like I don't have time to do this or I don't have time to do that. Those sometimes those things like exercise or spending time with friends or family, those are the things that actually recharge us and help us be more productive. All right, so some long-term deadlines to think about for the upcoming fall, spring, and summer. Um, there is the Office of University Dissertation and Thesis Services through the university libraries, and they have deadlines for when you have to submit your thesis or dissertation for a format review, like things have to be formatted in a certain way. And then there's a deadline for the actual final submission, which will be added into the university library itself. So you'll see the fall deadline is November 27th. That doesn't mean you wait till November 27th to submit something. That means you need to submit it well in advance and the library will notify you no later than the 27th of November to let you know if your formatting is correct. They do provide you with a template, um, which is super, super helpful. I highly recommend that you go and check that out. But if you were planning on graduating at the end of this fall semester, please note that the date for the format deadline is the 27th and the final submission deadline is December 1st if you're planning on graduating at the end of the semester. Um, and then I've listed the spring and the summer deadlines as well. Sometimes we have to push things back a little bit, that's okay. Um, but these are things that I would put on my calendar if I were still a grad student. All right, now you have a number of ways that you can manage your stuff. And I was wondering if any, if we could get, maybe get a couple people to share what are things that you use? Like, do you use a paper calendar? Do you use a wall calendar? Do you use elect electronic? So if maybe we can hear from a couple people about what you're currently using to keep track of your appointments or obligations or tasks. And you can turn on your microphone or you can type in the chat. So Sherry says Outlook, she just said calendar feature on iPhone. Michelle, I use my phone calendar and Outlook. Allison says Outlook. Julianne, has, I use a paper calendar on the wall and a portable booklet calendar. Hank says iPhone calendar and bullet journal. Yes, bullet journals are really cool because you can customize them however you'd like them to be. And you can put certain features if there's things you wanna track like your exercise or your nutrition or your mood, you can customize your bullet journal to include those kinds of things in there. Lynn says everything, digital calendar, reminders, paper, long-term and post-its if, if it's urgent. Yes, yes, it's okay to have multiple things. We just wanna duplicate a lot of stuff. Because it, it can be hard if we have too many things to make sure that that whatever we need to record is put in every single place. Um, but because you can do different levels, having multiple ways of tracking that is really helpful. 
Sophia says, I used a paper calendar, but it's not working very well because I forget to check it. Yes, whatever calendar you use, you need to have it in a place that you're going to look at it every single day. Whether that's, if it's paper, then you put it like front and center where you, you have no choice but to see it. Um, for some students, we'll put things like in their laptop, like when they close their laptop, we'll put stuff in there so that they see it. Or if you use electronic and you forget to open your electronic calendar, we'll actually make it like um, your home screen on your uh, browser. So every single time you open your browser, the first thing that, you, that comes up is your calendar um, until you get into that habit of always of checking it. Just going back to see the other comments that were put in. And uh let's see. And then there's a question if the bullet journal is an app. Typically it's on paper. You can use something like GoodNote or OneNote to do a digital version. Thank you for sharing that, Lynn. So yeah, it's usually hard copy, but there are other ways that you can do it. I would spend too much time like making everything perfect in a bullet journal. So that's one of the reasons I don't use it. And other people need to be able to make appointments with me. So I am fully committed to doing an electronic calendar. But if I had my my way about it, I would still be using paper. There's just something about writing it down that makes it easier for me to remember. So I've got on the screen an example of an electronic calendar. And this happens to be Google Calendar. Um, and what I've done on here is to put any deadlines as all day events. So you can see on Wednesday the 28th, it says draft intro due to chair. Um, you can also put reminders in an electronic calendar, but don't go crazy. If you have too many reminders, you'll start to ignore them. So be judicious in how many reminders you put for yourself. Um, if I really need something else as a reminder, it's probably more, it's probably better that I put a tickler on my calendar where I maybe I make an appointment with myself to say, all right, check out X, Y, or Z instead of just a reminder. So that way I've got time set aside in my calendar to actually do that particular thing. Um, and it doesn't have to be really involved. It might just be like double check the dates or make sure I'm on track for X. Okay, there's a lot of different ways that you can do it. The other thing I put on here is a weekly routine. Um, now, there, I've seen some folks who don't ever put their weekly routine on a calendar at all, and they just hold it all in their head, or folks will schedule every minute of every day. And I think maybe we can have a happy medium and put just a skeleton of a schedule together. If you don't write it down and you hold it in your head, it's going to eat up all your working memory. And then you're going to have to put forth a lot of effort to retrieve your schedule every time you are trying to do something or plan something or make an appointment. You have to pull that information to mind. And it just eats up all your working memory. And there's not enough room then to um, like do your work. Or if you're for, worried you're going to forget something, you're going to keep ruminating on it. So let's write it down someplace, paper or electronic, and um, also include that weekly routine. If you schedule every minute of every day and one thing goes wrong, the whole thing falls apart and then people just completely stop following a plan altogether and that's not good either. So you'll see on here, this schedule is very simple. It only includes the this person, the example that I've got here is um, somebody who's working full time. And yes, they know they work nine to five, but being able to put it on here and visually see, oh, that's a big block of time I don't have available to do my schoolwork or to work on my dissertation, okay? It just helps my brain have a nice little shortcut. This person has also committed to working um, from 6.30 a.m. to 8.30 a.m. every day, except for Sunday. Now they're gonna have to do more work than just this, but this is time that they've committed every day for two hours that they've got set aside and it's just part of their routine and they're gonna protect it just like an appointment just like work, this is time they've got set aside. And like I said, they're going to need to spend more time in the evenings and the weekends working on it. But this is like the, the time that is regularly set. Um, you can see there also is class on here. And I've, I've color coded it. So work is green. Um, the research and writing piece is kind of like a pinkish color. Class is, is yellow um, so that it, it's a nice shortcut for my brain. Now, on this example, I just put class. But 
if you have multiple classes, you probably should say the name of the class. Again, so you don't have to tax your memory to try and pull it to mind, okay? So this is just um, a weekly view. If we were to switch it to a monthly view, this all day event is gonna pop out. It'll be really easy to see. And that's what helps us to be able to switch back and forth. Sometimes we're gonna need to see like, what does my day look like? What does my week look like? What does my month look like? What does my semester look like? So you gotta switch back and forth between different views for um, to help you with planning, okay? So we've got our skeleton of a weekly routine and then it comes down to our day. What are the tasks I need to work on each day? Now, I think most of us had that experience in undergrad where we started to do more long-term planning um, instead of just a to-do list of what needs to be done for tomorrow. I think we started to be able to plan out a little bit further in advance. Um, and so this strategy is meant to help with that more long-term planning, okay? So this is called Google Keep. So that's the other reason I like to use the Google Calendar because you can actually open Keep right alongside and you can see your calendar and you can see Keep next to it. This is virtual sticky notes. Um, and what I've done on here is I've made a sticky note for my goals for the week. These are big hairy goals just for this week, not forever, but just for this week. So things like transcribing an interview and prepping my in vivo. And then because I've got to break this down into smaller pieces, Okay, if you're overwhelmed by a project, it's too big. Figure out what is something small that you can do. So um, I've broken these down into smaller pieces and there's other stuff I've got to get done. I can't just do these two things. So I've broken it down into things like attend a Zotero workshop, read and annotate two articles. So this is specific, it's measurable, it's attainable, it's relevant, and it's time bound. Because so I say, I'm going to do this on Wednesday. Okay, um, and then I've got read 10 pages. So notice it's very measurable. It's not, it's not study and it's not right. It's super, super specific. I'm trying to see where I have, I think I put a piece about writing. But I do have things like transcribe, um, read X number of articles. One of the ways that I like to procrastinate is by finding articles and then I run out of time to read them, analyze them and actually do the writing piece. So I have to put limitations on myself because that's one of the ways that I procrastinate. But this is just an example of how you can do a couple of tasks. If you have a big long to-do list and you don't get everything done, it feels really crummy. But with this, if you're prioritizing appropriately and you've done the two or three or four most important activities for a day, you're actually in really good shape, all right? So when you do this plan, it's not just planning today for tomorrow, it's planning the next, at least the next seven days, what you're gonna work on. And that means I'm gonna need to look at my long-term stuff, my long-term deadlines, what time I have available during the week. So like Mondays, I don't know if you noticed, Mondays, they've got writing in the morning, work all day, and then they have a class that goes till 10 o'clock at night. That is not a day to get a whole lot of work done. But maybe Sunday, I can get a few more things done. So maybe I'm not going to do any school-related tasks in addition to that two hours. Mm -hmm. I'm only going to do that two hours. Okay. So this is kind of just like normal time management kind of stuff for grad school. We also recommend that folks follow the Pomodoro timer method. Does anybody use Pomodoro? Allison says, yes. Hank says, I do. Noreen says, I've heard of it, but never used it. I should use it more often. So this is a, a way of um, kind of managing yourself, your attention and helping with your, um, like your motivation, all right? If I think about, oh my God, I have to sit here for eight hours. Like if I think about work, I have to sit here for eight hours and do work. Oh my God, that just seems so overwhelming. But if I break my day down into smaller chunks, it's much more manageable. So it's like, okay, I'm gonna meet with the students and then I have a supervision meeting and I have this. Well, we can do something similar with our research and our work for our classes. And we can say, all right, I'm going to work on this one task for 25 minutes, okay? So what you do is you set a goal and you say, all right, I'm gonna transcribe or I'm gonna read this article or I'm going to work on writing my introduction for 25 minutes. That's the only thing I can do. 
All right, so it helps us thwart multitasking because multitasking is really inefficient. Um, you can only do one cognitive thing at a time. It slows you down when you're switching back and forth between multiple things. So put your full focus on one thing. And what you do is you set a timer. Think about when you have a deadline at 11.59 p.m. and how productive all of a sudden you get at 11 p.m. It's like, oh my gosh, I haven't felt like writing this up until now, but now it's due and I have to get it done. And all of a sudden, the words finally come. All right. That is a really stressful place to be. We don't want to be doing that at the last minute. But for some of us, we need that impending deadline to get started on something. So this recreates that um, without such high stakes and not as quite as stressful. So think of it as I'm racing the clock to see how much I can get done in this time span. So set an alarm. Don't just look at the clock. You'll just do math the whole time. You'll be like, it's been 13 minutes. It's been 17 minutes. It's been 23 minutes. Okay, don't do that. Set the alarm and raise the clock. When it goes off, you're going to set it again for five minutes and take a break. The break should be refreshing. So no cyber loafing, no time wasters. No, you cannot watch Netflix in five minutes. Okay, don't even go there. Instead, it should be something like get up and stretch your body. Um, take a break from screens because we don't want to strain our eyes. So we need to look away at a distance for at least 20 seconds. Um, get a drink of water. Go get a snack. If I'm working from home, I can run upstairs and throw my my wash in the dryer and be back down and maybe in about six or seven minutes, but I'm physically moving, okay? And then if you wanna do another round, you can do it again, okay? So you can do one Pomodoro. If you have a break, an hour break in your day, you can get a Pomodoro done and you'll be surprised how much actually you can get done when you put your full focus on something during that time and it's just that one thing you'll be surprised how much you can actually get done. But if you wanna do more, you can do two, you could do three, you could do four. After four, which is just under two hours of work, then you're gonna take a longer break of 30 to 60 minutes, right? We need our brains to take a break so they can get refreshed, okay? Now, you don't have to do 25 minutes, but the nice thing about this is if you do start to daydream or get off task or you get distracted, you only lost 25 minutes, you didn't lose two or three hours, which can happen to me sometimes. Okay. Highly recommend it. You don't need to do it for everything all the time, but if you're having a hard time working on something, I highly recommend trying it. All right, so let's talk about when it comes to a big project, okay? Whatever that is, whether it's a project or you're having to do a thesis or you're having to do a dissertation or maybe you have to do a project and a dissertation, um, let's talk about how we're going to get that accomplished, okay? So first we have to figure out what are the parameters of the project thesis or dissertation. Um, th this is tough because it feels like, oh my gosh, I have to create something that is going to change the world or I have to cover everything that have ever been existing about this particular topic. And the reality is you just need to get it done because this is not the end of your scholarly journey. It is just the beginning. Right. It is a project or an activity meant to teach you how to do research or how to do a project. It is not the end goal. It's the beginning so that when you're finished, that you can continue as a scholar okay, or as a, um, a professional. Right. If you're in something like higher ed student affairs. But, but we do have a lot of projects that we do in, in the workplace. So it's like it's practice not meant to be perfect. So one of my grad professors says the best the best topic you can choose is one you can finish. It does not need to change the world. And that does help to kind of relieve that alleviate that pressure. Then we're going to make a plan on what we're going to do. And we want to communicate with anybody who's involved. So if we're really lucky, we might have the ability to hire people to help us collect data on something or we might have other individuals involved who are um, like maybe if I'm collecting data from a school, I need permission from that school in order to come in there and interact with their students. So I need to communicate with those folks. Um, I might need um, permission to use somebody's survey um, information, right? So other people are, are usually involved and we're gonna wanna communicate with those folks. Um, and then we're gonna break down some tasks and delegate the tasks to whoever is responsible for those tasks. We wanna keep track of our progress as we go. 
And then we're going to complete the project or the research, write up our results and submit everything to our chairperson or whomever is responsible for saying, yes, you're good on to the next phase, right? So usually with a thesis or dissertation, we need to have approval from our chair before we can share it with the committee and then the committee needs to review it and then it would get sent to the university dissertation and thesis services office for final like okay and approval right so there's lots of steps and there's lots of people that we need to get approvals from so here's a if you like visual stuff here's a flow chart where we start small then we do our planning our communication monitoring and then we complete our program all right, so I think one of the biggest things is to narrow it down, and that's really hard for a lot of grad students to do because when we start to get into the research that you need to do, you start to go down a lot of rabbit holes. Think very carefully and talk with your chair about what the limitations are going to be. Um, that's going to make your life a whole lot easier if you have some boundaries put around what your project is. Once you have a good idea about your project, you're going to need to brainstorm a list of tasks to complete, and then you're going to break that down into subtasks. I'm going to show you an example in case you're like, I don't know what she's talking about. Okay. It's a good idea to estimate how much time you think each thing is going to take, each task is going to take, and it can be like really broad strokes. Like, I think this is going to take me a week, or I think this is going to take two or three months, all right, which sounds really long, but Trust me, with these, some of these big projects, it does take that much time. Then you want to see, like, for the tasks and the subtasks, how are they interrelated with each other? Are there some things I have to finish first before I can start working on the next task? So we would call those sequential tasks. I have to do A before I can start on B. Then there's other things I can be doing at the same time. So maybe B and C I can actually work on simultaneously. I don't have to wait until B is finished to start on C. I can do both of those together. Um, but they're just broken down separately because they are separate tasks and I need to think of them. Um, they've got different requirements and things that I'm doing. So when they can be done simultaneously, we call those parallel tasks. Think about the consequences if something takes longer than expected. So sometimes you need materials for a project and um, you know, I have to think about like if I'm ordering surveys from somebody, maybe it's like a standardized survey and I need um, to purchase that survey and have it shipped to me. What happens if it's out of stock or what happens if there's, you know, bad weather and the, the shipment is delayed? I want to make sure I get those surveys well in advance um, before I'm supposed to actually administer those surveys. So like, what's the consequences? I don't want it to be delivered the day before because what if something happens, okay? So uh, you want to keep those things in mind, like, okay, I need to have this at least X number, like a week before to put a little cushion time in there in case any delays happen. Make sure you allow yourself some wiggle room. It's better to get it done earlier, right? There's no rule that says you can't start working on a task a little earlier than you have but have some cushion built into your schedule. All right, so here's an example of a checklist. This would be for a, like a simple thesis, for example. Um, and you can see I've got the tasks listed on the left. So the first task is to write the proposal. And I'm gonna estimate that that'll take four months. So basically a semester, it is sequential. This has to be done before anything else can be done. I have to write my proposal and get approval from my committee before I can move on. Once that's approved, it needs to get approved by the IRB. That is probably gonna take a couple months because they don't meet all the time. They have a, a meeting schedule. And so that may take a couple of months to do. So you can see it's sequential and it has to be started after A, okay? Then I've got materials. I've got phase one, which is a pretest. Then I've got um, to input and analyze my pretest data. And for this one, you can see I've got this as sequential, but it's parallel to the pretesting phase. So as I'm administering this pretest, as data is coming in, I don't have to wait till I have all of my data. I can start entering it right away. 
Um, and that's going to save me time in the end. So I don't have to wait till the end of the week when everything is in. It's probably going to be a little more manageable to do a little bit every day. But this is where you can see like how I can be doing um, two things in parallel at the same time. I've got phase three, which is the actual intervention that I'm testing. Um, and that, again, is a semester's long. So if I was going to see, like, I don't know, a tutoring pilot, and I wanted to see if the tutoring pilot would help students improve their performance in their grades, um, I'm going to give them a pretest. I'm going to do the tutoring during the semester, and then we'll do a post-test at the end to see if anything has improved. Okay. So... Then we've got the post-test and then the input of the data and then writing up the results, okay? So I'm gonna pause and say, are there, what questions do you guys have about this checklist? It asked you, could you explain the type heading? I may have missed it. Um, so S is sequential and P is parallel. So what type is it? Is it a sequential task? Like, does it have to happen in a certain order or is it a parallel task where they can happen at the same time? Um, and then because it's like task A, task B, so you can see here in the last column it says, what it's dependent on. So like I can't start E until D has has started, right? I have to wait till that part started. I can't input any data till I actually have some data. So that's a great question. What's the type? It's sequential or is it parallel? Just pausing to see if there's any more questions. So Kang says, can we start IRB process? We'll write in the proposal so it can be done by the proposal defense. So you're going to want to talk to your committee about that. Often you need your completed proposal before you can submit to IRB because your committee may change some of the parameters. And so they may not be cool with you submitting it to IRB until they've approved it. But I would say, I said, talk to your committee, talk to your chair. Your chair is going to know what the, um, uh, like common practices are for your college or department better than I would. I think that's probably going to be a, on a case by case kind of basis. All right. So Medina says, my question is for a master's student. What's the best time to start writing a proposal? Which term? All right. So I had to actually start my proposal my very first semester and shop it around to different professors which if you don't know how to write a proposal is kind of a challenge, okay? So um, because a master's program is usually only a couple of years, if you're doing a thesis, um, it, you know, it's kind of like you work on that proposal the first, first couple of semesters, and then you would implement it the next couple of semesters and do the research and gather all the data. So you probably want to get started on it pretty soon if you're in a two-year program. You're welcome. All right. So these, this list of tasks and determining what kind of tasks they are, this is a process called uh, making a Gantt chart. And this is great for these longer term time management things, right? So the other time management we talked about is like, our personal time management, keeping ourselves on track with what we need to be doing and where we need to be doing it. A Gantt chart is time management for a project specifically. And you can see on here, I've got the list of the tasks in the left, and then it has a little bar that, that um, illustrates the amount of time that I estimated that task is gonna take. And I think here you can also see a little bit um, where we've got the sequential tasks and the parallel tasks. Right, so the proposal, sequential, it's gotta be finished before I can do IRB. So you can see IRB, sequential, and then, but I can be working on my materials and getting the materials together while the IRB process is happening. So I've put that for, like you can see in June, those two overlap. Then I can't start phase one till I have IRB approval and the materials. 
And then I'm going to collect my data, but I can start inputting, you know, and I can start working on phase two while that data is being processed and, and entered. So there's overlap there. And then the end is all sequential. It's like those pieces need to be taken care of. So you want to have this visual, visual, it makes it a lot easier to keep track of everything. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Sydney, explaining what IRB is. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm in the social sciences. And so like, <laughs> it's just, I'm, I'm used to that. And I don't remember that not every um, discipline uses IRB stuff. All right, now there's different software that you can get to help you with something like this. This screenshot is from a platform called um, Tom's Planner. Tom's Planner has a free version. They always tease you, have you start with something that's free and then they're like, oh, you need to upgrade and pay for it. I just checked today again and Tom's Planner is still free of charge for a personal account. So it's one schedule. So if you're working on a thesis dissertation or project, um, this is gonna be sufficient for you. And they have a template. So I actually think this is actually the, the example or the template they have for a dissertation. And they've got it broken down into topic finding, dissertation proposal, literature review, and then you can see all the subtasks that are listed under it. And we've got the, the calendar to the right, which you scroll across and it shows you um, additional information. So I just wanted to show you how um, it could look if you did more of a professional platform. And I'm going to talk about other platforms you can use right now. Um, there's lots of apps out there. Maybe you don't like the way that the Gantt chart looks and your brain just works a little bit differently. There are other platforms, things like um, Basecamp or Trello. Um, MS Teams does have a project planning um, platform, and it's kind of like almost like virtual index cards that you were posting on a board um, where you can put a task on that that board and you put a date that it's due and you can move those cards around and you can start, you move the cards in different piles. So you can say, okay, this one's in progress and then this one's completed. So you kind of have three piles that go across the computer screen. So it's just a different way of like, however you like your brain to be organized, you, there's different ways to um, do it. So Gautam is asking about MS project. I was trying to see if that's available um, yes, I would say if you have access to MS Project, yes, you could use that as well. Um, the Brain is an online, um, like a concept mapping um, platform. Again, they have free version and paid versions. And concept mapping is like you put a concept and then you can draw different lines. So you can use that to make flow charts or to just organize your ideas. That one's pretty awesome. Um, and then things like Wonderlist and Matchware are also planning ones, and these have been recommended by other graduate students. I have not used Wonderlist or Matchware myself. I'm not sure if other people have, um, but I know Trello is pretty popular. Or Tom's Planner is pretty popular as well. Do you folks have other software that you use for project planning or like keeping track of things? Bigger, bigger projects like this. What's the first one you showed before? That was Tom's Planner. You're welcome. All right, it is gonna be so important that you put an organizational system in place, even if you're not the best organizer, okay? So something that I found was when I started getting really saturated in the literature and I started using different databases, I would pull up the same research again and again, which is good. That's actually a good, when you get to that saturation point, it shows like, okay, we're done. We're done with finding sources and, and you know, I can just write my literature review part. Um, but it can also be frustrating because it's like, oh man, I just wasted all this time by downloading, you know, like taking a look at this article and I start reading it. And it's like, oh, I've read this before. So I recommend keeping some kind of a research journal where you're keeping track of the things that you are finding. The, you know, not like a necessarily a comprehensive list, but 
things like what are the keys, the key search terms that I've used? What are the things that I found? Where are there gaps? What's my plan for the next time? So it's like keeping a diary. So I would write the date and like what I was looking for, a little summary about what I had found, and then maybe other search terms I wanted to use or to see how can I exclude this. And that's actually great to bring if you meet with one of the subject librarians. So you can say, here's what I've already done and databases I've already used, and the search terms I've already used. Um, that makes it a little bit easier. Um, and I literally kept it in a composition notebook, like a, like one that you got in elementary school. Um, but you can keep it electronically or you can keep it in a, another kind of notebook. But every time I did work for my, dis my thesis, I would write it down. If you have any paper documents that you have, come up with a system for filing those. I purchased a rolling filing thing. So it was a, really easy to move around my apartment. And I set up fi hanging file folders for each part of it. And at one point, I think I had to reorganize it, but it was a lot easier to start with an organization system than to like put everything in a pile and then try to figure out a system later. It was easier, easier to start with something and then um, adjust it later. Have a digital archive of all of your documents. So again, don't just start throwing everything on your desktop or in your My Documents folder on your computer, create a folder for your project, and then you're gonna to start to create subfolders and you will put like, here's all the stuff, here's all my drafts for my lit review, or here's all of the Excel spreadsheets with my data and then start creating those folders so that, and you put things away as soon as you do them or you create them. So later on, you're not trying to be like, oh my gosh, is this on the OneDrive? Is it on my computer? Is it on my phone? Is it on my tablet? Like have a place that this stuff lives and make sure you put it all away as you're using it. Um, and then I also highly recommend using a citation manager. I'm gonna talk more about citation managers on the next slide. Back up everything. Okay, I'm old school. I really don't completely trust OneDrive. I know it's like, oh, then you don't have multiple copies. And it is really nice because then no matter what device you're on, you can always access it. But honestly, I totally, I don't completely trust it. Um, so back up everything. Get yourself an external hard drive and back it up. Have another place that you save it. Maybe you save a copy on your computer and on the OneDrive and on your Excel or your external hard drive. Every year there's a sad, sad story of some grad student who like lost everything because they they their laptop got stolen or they got a virus or something weird happened. Um, so yeah, back up, back up, back up some more. All right. So citation managers, oh my gosh, you guys are so lucky that these are available. I wish this existed when I was working on my um stuff. When I took my last grad class, I forced myself to learn how to use one. Um, because I was still doing hard copy, old school, handwriting my notes and things like that. So a citation manager is an electronic platform where you can keep track of all of your articles, um, books, sort any sources that you're using. Um, the screenshot here is an example from Zotero. Um, and Zotero has an add-on for Chrome the Chrome browser and for Firefox, it probably has one for Microsoft Edge as well. And so on my um, browser, there's a, a Z in the corner on my browser. So anytime I come across an article or a book or something, a web page, then I'm like, ooh, this is interesting. I wanna save it for later. I don't have to just bookmark it in my browser. I can click that Z and it's going to magically put that citation information is going to populate all this information here on the right. You see that says journal article and the title, the author, the abstract. All that is going to populate it automatically for me. It'll save the link, the what the URL it is fantastic. It also allows you to take notes. You can add tags. So if you're like using a specific key term that goes across different articles, um, you can put that information in here. You can make folders, you can put things in different folders and how you wanna organize it. I highly recommend, especially if you are a doc student, anytime you have any articles you're doing for or paper or books or anything, put them in the citation manager, even for um, other assignments and things, because if you're 
you know, what you should do is any research papers you're writing, if you can associate it with whatever your dissertation topic is, and then you're building up your sources as you go, instead of having to like find all the sources from the beginning. Um, so Vabhavi says, do we need to log in for Zotero? So yes, you would need to create a Zotero account. Um, and the library has Zotero workshops all the time. So you can learn more about how to use Zotero. So in order for me to use that little magic Z on my browser, I actually have to need to have the Zotero app open and it'll just populate it for me. But then later on, when you're writing, what you can do is there's an extension for Microsoft Word or for Google Docs that you say cite and you say what, you know, there's a little drop down where you can find the source that you're citing. And um, so it will put that in-text citation for you, whether it's going to be MLA or APA or um, uh, Chicago manual or whatever style, you tell it what style you want, it's gonna put it in your in-text citation the way you want it and it will populate your reference list at the end. So we have a question about, um, Alice asked, the GMU libraries led me to Mendeley, is that still supported as a citation manager? Yes, so if Mendeley works for you, great. Um, again, these are, I just, I personally use Zotero, so that's one of the reasons I'm recommending it. A lot of students also use EndNote, um, and then there's Mendeley. So have, get a citation manager and pick it, whatever you pick, learn how to use it really well, and it is going to make your life so much easier. Because when you start to rewrite your paper and you start taking out sources, it makes it so much better to um, populate that ref that reference list or that citation, work citation, works. We're excited list at the end. Everything has to match. Your in-text stuff has to match whatever is listed at the end. Um, you do need to double check it. Sometimes it makes little mistakes, but to not have to worry about like how many spaces do I have to put after a period when you have hundreds of sources at the end of a dissertation is going to help so, so much. All right, so at some point you gotta start writing. There's always going to be more to read. You're never going to keep up with everything that's been, going to be published because every day something new is being published. So at some point you just have to kind of stop. And unless there's a compelling reason for you to go back into the literature, you need to just stop and just start writing. Okay. And if you're somebody who likes to write it all in your head before you actually start to handwrite it or type it, I see a lot of students who are trying to write it perfectly in their brain before they put pen to paper or they start to type on the keyboard. And that is a mistake because your working memory is super small and can only hold like seven things. And so you're only gonna be able to do a few sentences in your head and then you're gonna get overwhelmed and then you're not gonna make any progress or you'll get stuck and keep working on the same part over and over in your head. Writing is an iterative process. We're going to write it and we're going to rewrite it and we're going to rewrite it again. Okay. And writing it out is a way to help you see what your thinking process is. It's a way to organize your ideas. Okay. So we're going to write it down to get it out of our working memory to make room to deal with the other information. Because a lot of thesis and dissertations and project write ups are going to be maybe a hundred pages or probably more. All right, you can't write all that just in your head. It's okay to jump around sections. If you're like, man, I don't really know what to put in this section, but I feel like I wanna write my methodology. That's, you know, that's okay. As long as we're making some progress forward. Um, and I don't know what it's like for your department, but for our, for mine, I had to have the first three chapters written before anything else. That was part of the proposal was chapter one, the intro to the lit review. Chapter three was the methodology. Um, I had to have those written up before that was part of the proposal. So whatever part I could work on that was great just because I was making progress. The other thing that trips students up is they're trying to make their, their draft proposal perfect before they send it to their professor. Again, that's a mistake because remember, this is a learning process. They're not expecting anything perfect, but they need you to turn something in. So one, that they know you're working on it, and two, they can give you guidance on it. 
And so instead of seeing like, oh, the feedback from the professor as being critical, see the feedback from the professor as being a guide for you to help you do better and to get to your end goal, which is to get your thesis, dissertation, or project approved and accepted and to graduate. Okay. So you've got to send them something as you go along. It's okay. To, they don't, they're not looking for it to be perfect. And if you spend all this time like polishing every single word on every single page, when they tell you they're going to tear it apart and make you do it over again, you'll be very frustrated. Okay. So just know that they're going to make you do it and rewrite it and rewrite it again. And then your committee is going to probably have you rewrite it, rewrite it again. That's just part of this whole process. So just write it and edit it later. All right. So as we go, it's going to feel a little bit lonely. Usually when students get to this stage, they are finished up with all of their classes. Um, make sure that you've got a standing, like a, a set meeting with your chair. Don't do it when you feel like it because um, time will slip away really quickly. It'll be easy to procrastinate. So that doesn't mean meeting with your chair every week, but maybe it's you do a check-in every two weeks or you do a check-in every month, but have a regular meeting set up with your chair. Um, it's also a good idea to join a writing group for, for accountability. They don't have to be writing the same kind of stuff. They don't even have to be in your same department. But again, it's good for accountability. So you can kind of, you know, share with each other, like where you're at with stuff, what challenges that you're facing, um, the uh, grad life, uh, the library and the writing center um, sponsor weekly write-ins uh, every Friday. So you can join the weekly write-ins. It's good for accountability. And if you do have a group that you work with, like you could create your own writing group. Um, you don't have to go with one that's already formal, but talk with them regularly about your success, celebrate the success and talk about your challenges to come up with some solutions, not to just, yeah, it's nice to commiserate a little bit, but they'll probably also have really good suggestions for solutions for you as well. Um, some of my friends, what they did to stay on track with their dissertation was to uh, register for conferences and submit proposals. Because there's no, there's not like solid deadlines for a dissertation like there is for a class with a paper, because they we knew that they had to present a, pro, a poster or they were giving a lightning talk or they were giving a standalone presentation at a conference, that had a deadline. And then they got to share what they were learning um, and they got feedback from other people. And so it helped them keep on track. So they would just present a small part of their dissertation over time. And it really helped them stay on track. Now more than ever, you need to have good self-care. And I know the first thing I think of is like, oh, it's bad day. That's not what I mean when I say self-care. These are the things we do to take care of ourselves mentally and physically every single day. Things like brushing our teeth or taking a walk regularly or having date night with your significant other. Okay, so make sure you're getting in some physical movement, that, get you, that you're eating a balanced diet. Sleep is so important. I know this is the part that people usually cut back on, but maybe there's something else that can be cut back on instead of that. Maybe it's like instead of, you know, keeping the house super, super perfectly pristine, clean, you kind of let a couple things go. Like, I don't have to vacuum every day. I'm going to vacuum every three days instead to help you find some other time. But don't cut back on sleep. Most of us don't sleep enough. Um, and social life, have some things to look forward to. All right. So inevitably, something in life will happen that could either, uh, that could interfere with your progress. Um, I'll, I'll just disclose for myself, um, during my program, I lost my job. And it's really hard to think about writing a paper when you're worried about paying the rent and where you're going to live and um, finding a new job. And so um, I spoke with my professor and got an incomplete for that particular class um, so that we I could kind of get my life together um, and then finish up the class at the end because this kind of happened towards the end of the semester. And that really made a world of difference to me. So have a plan, um, decide, is this professional life or death? Sometimes it's okay to take a leave of absence. Just talk with your advisor or your chair about the policies for your department on how does that, how does that work? And do I need to renew it if I need to have more than one semester off? Uh, but sometimes we need to, we need to take a break. And that's okay. 
figure out what's flexible and what's not. Those deadlines for university thesis and dissertation office, um, those are set, but you know what? Maybe I need to push my graduation back a semester. Okay, and then that, that's gonna give me a little bit more wiggle room. Um, talk to your chair or your department and it's okay to ask for help. All right, we're here to help. There's lots of resources at Mason that are here to help you because we want you to be successful. Now, internal blocks sometimes can be worse than anything external, although external stuff can be really challenging. Remember that this is a learning process and we want to maintain a, a growth mindset. I don't have to know how to do it perfectly. If you're like, man, I, I don't know how to use this software program. I don't know how to use NVivo. I don't understand SPSS. Just say, I don't know how to do it yet. That represents a growth mindset and I'm here to learn. Recognize your internal thoughts and emotions. You're gonna hear some negative stuff from your brain. Just cause, you, just cause you're thinking it or you're having a feeling doesn't make it true. I can say, oh, I'm not good enough to do this. There's no way I can possibly do this. They made a mistake when they admitted me to this program. Okay, I think we all have that self-doubt at some point, but just say like, okay, just cause I'm having this thought or this feeling doesn't make it true. I'm gonna go ahead and push forward or ask for help or reach out to somebody for assistance. Give yourself a pep talk. What would your best friend say to you if you said that to them? They'd say, no, you've been successful in the past. You can do it again. Um, I'm a big fan of crappy writing. Instead of writing it perfectly, write the crappiest paper you've ever written in your entire life. That takes some of the pressure off of it making it perfect. Because again, we're going to rewrite it anyways. Set rewards for yourself. They can be small rewards like, oh my gosh, I got my stuff done. I'm going to reward myself with my favorite herbal tea, or, hey, when my proposal is accepted, I'm going to go out to dinner with my friends to celebrate because that's a big milestone. Um, so have some rewards that are built in. The anticipation of the reward is going to help you with motivation and concentration. And of course, get professional help if you need that. Like I said, there's lots of resources here at Mason to help you with that. So we have counseling and psychological services. They provide free and confidential um, individual counseling, group therapy, they have crisis services available. We also have timely care, which is virtual mental health services. And this is free to students. It doesn't cost you anything. And, and, and for the most part, it's confidential. They're not gonna reveal to your department that you came in. They're not gonna share that with anybody unless you give them written permission to do that. Um, so just know that that service is available. Grad Student Life is a font of information. You can come to learning services. Subject librarians should be your best friends, okay? You can make an appointment with them on the library website. The Dissertation and Thesis Services Office has information about how the formatting and the timelines, and they also have workshops on how the process works. And of course, big fan of the Writing Center. I use the Writing Center throughout my grad work. Okay, so that is it. I'm out of time with one minute to spare. Thank you guys so much for joining me. Um, we're going to make the recording available to everybody and we'll send out a copy of the slides. Absolutely, Vicki, thank you so much for sharing this plethora of information and your wisdom and your time with us. This was absolutely amazing. Thank you everybody for joining us. We can give some applause, some virtual applause for Vicki for a great oh. presentation. <laughs> Are there you. any questions that anybody had? I will go ahead and I'll stop the recording.